Imagine you wake up bright and early, checking boxes off your to-do list with tons of energy already. You got a big smile on your face and your day is just getting started. You chase the girl of your dreams around the house with a big smile all day long. Wouldn't you love that? Well, what we would also love, at least you and me, is a little bit of hypermasculinity, at least the kind that comes with the use of androgens. <laughs> and a massive, never-ending libido. We want a youthful complexion, but a physique that's very well recognized. Newsflash, you are going to fail at achieving any of this if you don't watch to the end of this video. Bodybuilding and taking gear at its extremes is not gonna get you anywhere near what I just described. You are going to feel exhausted, unemotional, unmotivated to do anything outside of train one hour a day, and you're just gonna get stuck in your ways and repulse everyone around you. Today, I'm going to attempt to break down the eternity stack. It's something that I fully plan on deploying for myself once that time does come for me to lay down the 3cc syringe. I'm going to be explaining everything in the methodology from the pharmacology, which is of course everyone's favorite part, but diet and training as well. I think this is something that's wildly important for people who are actively competing right now to watch, or honestly just really anyone using drugs and living the bodybuilding lifestyle. Right now, you are in your safe, comfy little bodybuilding bubble, but that bubble has to pop at some point. And when it does, trouble usually follows. When you stop bodybuilding, it becomes hard to define how to eat, how to train, how to just be a human afterwards. This video is going to serve as a way for you to find purpose that isn't just eating and training all day. I also want to say that many things educators in this space say is it depends, and this usually is the right answer. But what I'm going to try to explain to you in this video is a plug and play full stop. But what if I told you the key to longevity and endless energy isn't in a pill or an injection, but rather in your lifestyle. Listen, I know lifestyle stuff isn't fun and I promise I'm gonna make this extremely quick, but it's something you can massively benefit from and it serves its purpose well. Just watch till the end of this section for some massive clarity on lifestyle factors that I think could help you tremendously, especially as a retiring bodybuilder. Getting right into this and making it as quick as possible, we're looking at a time-restricted eating window, something like 14 hours. If I start eating at 8 a.m., that means I generally have to stop eating at about 6 p.m., thus allowing myself to have zero food for 14 hours. This is the best way to make sure that you stay metabolically efficient and keep everything grooving within your body. And when I say grooving, I'm referring to literally digestion. The migrating motor complex only works at its best when we are in a fasted state. Most athletes aren't fasted for even eight hours some of the times. Shorter eating windows, eight hours or shorter, have actually been shown to increase risks of cardiovascular disease by 91%. And doing this as well, you're going to find a lot more sustainable blood glucose that isn't so volatile and spiking throughout the day, which is something we want to avoid. And there's also a lot to be said about training yourself to eat a little bit less than you were when you were an active athlete. Sleeping is the next thing, and I know that every Andrew Huberman video in the world has probably talked about this, and trust me, I've heard them all and I'm bored of it too. But here's the skinny and summarized points so you can take home with you and effectively use them to probably improve yourself. I've read four to five books on the subject matter entirely, and they really all come to the same conclusion. Everyone is different, everyone has different sleep requirements, everyone needs different sleep environments. So generally, you want to make sure that your room is cool. We find that generally speaking, 60 degrees ish upwards to the upper 60 degrees is about perfect where most studies show you have the best rate of REM and slow wave sleep. For the communist lovers out there, that's about 15.6 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius in the environment that you're sleeping in. And no, that is not the actual skin surface. That's just the floating air in the environment. There also needs to be virtually no light in your room. Something that is actually pretty hard to achieve even with blackout curtains because we have all these little LEDs around our room and on a fire alarm or something else, a device that you have plugged in, there's going to be an LED and those LEDs have enough light to disrupt our normal sleep architecture and specifically blunt the release of melatonin, a compound that helps us stay asleep once we've fallen asleep. As well, waking up and turning on the overhead lights in the bathroom is another clear way to destroy your sleep architecture and ruin could have been a really good night sleep. So there's a couple of things that you need to do. One, turn off all of the lights, get blackout curtains, and make sure that your room is pitch black. Three, tape up all the LED light strips that you have in your room or little bulbs that are on your fire alarms or anything else just to make sure that that bright light and is not exposing itself to your eyes. Unfortunately, as difficult as it is to take out your piss pistol and pee in the dark without nuking the entire toilet, you're going to have to learn how to do that just a little bit. It doesn't take much to plug in a night light that's very dim and below your eye's sight to go to the bathroom with. It's 
going to work effectively. Not ideal. Ideally, you just pee in the dark. I understand why that might be hard. Okay, one more thing. Oh, no. Don't wear socks while you sleep because it can impair heat dissipation, which is really critical. Take a warm shower before bed typically. And I think most people, if you are training, should be taking about two showers a day. And don't take melatonin in general. For most people, it's not going to do what you think it will do. And more often than not, it will impair sleep architecture versus repair it. If you are going to take it, don't take anything more than 0.5 milligrams of melatonin at one given time. All right, we're almost done here waking up. Get a drink of water. My go-to is about a liter. Essentially, you just need to become more hydrated because you've dehydrated overnight. And as a large human, this is without a doubt true. You flush water like crazy, but once you are running low on hydration, things really go south. So please do me a huge favor and slam some water when you wake up. And again, I usually find about a liter to work well for me. This allows the whole system to really get a kickstart. I feel more refreshed and much more capable of focusing and more importantly, physically performing even without eating once hydrated. But the one thing you're not going to do is drink coffee. Drinking caffeine can have some serious consequences if drank too early. Let your natural cortisol response wake you up, which is your natural circadian rhythm. Cortisol helps us feel alert, but consuming caffeine during this surge can diminish its effects and maintaining a healthy circadian rhythm is critical for optimal sleep and wakefulness. So delay your coffee because it can help you with this. Waiting about 90 minutes after waking up allows adenosine levels to rise slightly, making caffeine much more effective at blocking receptors and keeping us alert throughout the day. You need to let some adenosine fix itself to the receptors before you consume any form of caffeine. Early caffeine consumption can even lead to increased dependence on caffeine because the body relies less and less on natural cortisol release. So naturally, waiting 90 minutes allows the body to rely more on the natural wakefulness mechanism, reducing the risk of caffeine dependence if a withdrawal does occur. The next thing you're going to do without your caffeine is go outside and in the sun if possible. Go for a fast paced walk, but keep your eyes on the horizon. This forward facing ambulatory movement is actually really effective at stimulating our brain's architecture, specifically the frontal cortex and the processing center of the brain. This form of locomotion has been shown to improve cognitive function in a lot of different ways. Lastly, getting above about 8,000 steps a day, which is why you should be taking your morning walk, decreases all-cause mortality by up to 50%. Literally just start getting up and moving. Midday, and this is it. I promise. Working is going to be a critical function, and you need to make money. So here are a few tips to stay productive during the work season. Unless you're self-employed, and then it's not so dreadful, but I think you still need tips. Take breaks often. No one is too cool for breaks. A 30-minute nap can rejuvenate the brain to a fully functional state, and it's it's much better than functioning at 10% when you're nearly falling asleep and nodding off every 15 minutes. You can get five hours of garbage work done or two hours of highly productive work. And I would still argue that the two hours is wildly more quality and effective work than the latter five hours that's just gonna be garbage. Also during your breaks, you wanna take frequent times to go outside and expose yourself to sun. I know this sounds stupid, but there's many people who don't make the effort and we are circadian based humans after all. And the sun is one of the way that we dictate our circadian function. And make an effort to listen to 40 Hertz by Neural Beats while working in any form of deep work. This is something I did while writing the script for this video, and I think it's really productive to help anyone move forward in any sort of productive task. 40 Hertz beats actually have been shown to greatly improve cognitive function or and after tasks as well as memory storage. And I know this next one's going to be kind of soft. Make friends, like, like real friends. I can't stress the importance of having a feeling of completeness. As I've aged, it's become much harder to find real and true friends, and I gotta admit, I'm extremely extremely busy and it's hard to maintain good friendships when you're this busy. I admire friend groups for the richness that they do have. Don't be afraid of moving laterally to something outside of fitness to make new friends. It can contribute to your wealth, not in a monetary sense, but just as a human being by large. It'll also help you practice the ability to express your emotion, to vocalize your opinions, to express your internal thoughts, something that we don't often get to do unless we're writing down on a piece of paper. In fact, without writing the scripts for these videos, some of which the videos I don't, but I never really come across as me. It's only when I write out my thoughts that I'm able to consolidate them into true spoken words. And having friends to speak to honestly is essentially the same practice, but 10 times better. Okay, so most people can handle the lifestyle stuff just fine. But when it comes to the next piece in the puzzle, it's like trying to solve a Rubik's Cube at a frat party. One wrong move and you're face first into someone's disgusting threesome and you get chlamydia in the eye. Okay. 
okay, I really busted your balls there for a second, but honestly, we're gonna talk about nutrition and it's gonna be something you likely want to hear about. Full disclosure here, there is no right way of doing nutrition. There is a wrong way though. So your opinion might be significantly different than mine and that is totally cool. However, I would just challenge you to ask where you formulated those opinions and who gave them to you because they might not be your opinions at all. They might just be something you picked up from someone on social media. Sit with yourself and extremely think like critically about these thoughts and pontifications and opinions that you've developed over time. If you sat critically and thought to yourself why you think this is right and not use the reasoning that someone else provided to you on social media and you still think it's right, then by all means, you need to follow that path, not what others have told you is right. Same thing goes for me too. Meal construction. This is going to be an easy thing to summarize. If you want to feel great, eating like a bodybuilder is not the way to do it. I think anyone who has actually done this for a long period of time can attest to it. So let's break down the very basics of how to eat and not be a bodybuilder. First things first, obviously protein holds the most amount of micronutrients per gram. However, it's also the one that can actively age cells. So it's an interesting battle between high and low protein. Here's my advice because there is no research. Stick around one gram per pound of body weight. I think this isn't too much to tax the body to use, nor is it constantly going to gas up mTOR. Protein consistently should consist of animal meats and dairy products that are rich in nutrients. Things like grass-fed beef cuts, bison, wild-caught salmon, eggs, dairy products, ideally some form of raw dairy, which I'm not a carnivore. I am nowhere near a carnivore, but if you just pair these gram to gram with other foods and the net nutrients in them, you get much, much more here than you would per net calorie in vegetables or fruits, for example. And that's exactly why I'm putting them first. Veggies come completely optional in my book because ultimately there's not really that many benefits to eating them. I mean, there's tons of oxalates and pesticides and things of this nature that we probably want to avoid. But if you can get fresh vegetables and fresh fruits, I mean, there's really no harm done. I just don't think they're that contributing to overall health besides the short chain fatty acids produced by a bit of fiber. Things you want to look out for are high amounts of spinach, tomatoes, cauliflower, broccoli. These are things that contain certain phytochemicals that will inevitably cause damage over time. And for me sitting and working with hundreds of people, this is what I've concluded. I'm not just sitting behind a desk and reading research papers all day long. I'm applying this kind of information with clients and seeing what works best most often is honestly a minimization of total vegetable intake. Find more often than not that increasing vegetables will wreak havoc on someone's digestive system and to be honest kidney function with the amount of oxalic acids they're consuming now we all love keto and carnivore and all this bullshit but what do we do with carbs? Carbs are not the devil, and they're certainly not the devil for longevity. We want to be a bit more strategic with how we use them. Carbohydrate will definitely be a little bit low compared to what it would be if you were bodybuilding, for example. The most carbohydrates that you'll actually consume are going to be around the workout. Let's just say two hours post and two hours pre-workout. And then outside of that small window, carbohydrates are going to be basically reduced down to nothing. Instead, I would keep the fats elevated to keep you 100% functional. The fats I would prefer to use are actually in the proteins that I just advised. The eggs, the wild-caught salmon, the wild or like grass-fed beef. After that, I would like to add dairy products just to make sure you're getting enough calcium. So again, raw or hard cheeses. Honestly, milk if you can tolerate it. And Greek yogurts, cottage cheeses, things like this. Then after that, if you've already met all of your calcium needs, then I would add in some forms of nuts, cashews, Brazil nuts, things of this nature that have healthy fatty acids, but also contribute to your micronutrient intake with things like selenium, but not peanuts. Peanuts are not nuts, they're legumes, and they don't have a micronutrient profile that's favorable for someone who's investing in their own health. And after that, I would say like avocado and that's really, or chia seeds, and that's pretty much about it. This is nice because you've hopefully already created diaries of what you're eating. So you generally know how much you need to consume to sustain weight. So reduce the carbohydrates and increase the fatty acids. And you're going to find a generally net neutral caloric intake that should keep you satisfied, cognitively functioning extremely well and keep you from crashing midday. Again, I have to stress this. I'm not saying eat keto. I'm not saying eat carnivore. I'm not saying eat any of these bullshit 
bullshit diets. I'm just walking you through how to select the highest quality foods that will help your health for the longest period of time. I'm still telling you to eat carbohydrates. I'm still telling you that you can eat vegetables and certainly eat fruits for carbohydrates. But just don't depend on vegetables for your micronutrients. Okay, so that was what to eat. Now, when to eat is kind of the next part in the equation. We need to look at how many meals should you be eating on a daily basis and when should they be consumed. Well, overall, you should remember that I talked about a 14-hour time-restricted eating window. What I usually like to do, because foods can actually improve your sleep if you're eating the right kinds of them, is have people fast earlier in the day. Fasting to around 10 to 12 p.m. is really effective at improving cognitive function, giving yourself plenty of leeway and room to clear out your digestive system in the morning especially. Throughout the day, you're nice and full with your high-quality foods, and you are doing great. And by the time you get to bed, the carbohydrates that you did eat through the day will still be residually there and your insulin levels will be elevated to suppress your CNS and put you to rest like a nice little baby. You definitely have to consider the mental faculty and how you're functioning there. And this is why I recommend morning fasting because usually if you're like me, you get a majority of your work done right away in the morning. If I'm eating on a full stomach and I'm trying to produce highly, highly effective and quality work, it's just not gonna happen when I'm eating a ton of food, especially in carbohydrate. Now you might ask me, what about if I train in the morning? Well, it's gonna get crazy here, like crazy, crazy time, right? We're gonna train fasted. And then usually because you'll be fasting in the morning and then eating later in the evening, your meals are going to replete the glycogen that you've expended in that workout. And then by the time you wake up the next day, you should have plenty of energy to soar right into your next workout if you have to train fasted. Note, if you're the type of person that gets really hungry straight away after waking up, welcome to the club. It takes a while for your body to adapt because of the lifestyle you led before this. Don't stray away because you feel bad. Realize that this transition will be just as uncomfortable as it was getting into bodybuilding give yourself time. Okay, so sodium and electrolytes are really important to stay hydrated as well, but what do we do with them? Not get really neurotic, that's kind of for sure. To be honest, it's kind of meh. Most people thrive without ever considering their mineral balance. So basically, salt your meals to taste with iodized salt a few times a day, and eat enough potassium to be at about a 1 to 3 ratio of sodium to potassium. The rest of your electrolytes should pretty much be captured in your diet if you're eating effectively as I illustrated before. Now, most people handle this just fine. But if you miss this next part in the method, you are completely skipping foreplay and letting go of all the fireworks. None of this is going to matter if you don't listen up. And you've waited long enough, so let's talk about pharmacology. Fundamental philosophies here are actually quite simple. Let your health guide the practice. Now this does require a lot of work for you, and I can already hear everyone leaving this video clicking away where their D-ball only cycles are waiting in the mail for them. And this doesn't just mean blood work, but it also means organ imaging. Things like an echocardiogram, an EKG, and even more. If you don't know what labs to get, I will provide a lab cheat sheet down below, which you can use to really quickly find out what labs are out there that you should be getting as someone who's invested in caring about their health. Let's just say globally your health is in order. Where do you start on the internity stack? The same way you'd start any stack, with testosterone. And I hear most clickers just clicking away to the next video. As a general rule of thumb, I like a good dose of testosterone. If you tolerate it well, like I do, it's pretty damn amazing. I would run a dose of about 200 to 250 milligrams per week. If you can't tolerate testosterone well and you convert to estrogen relatively quickly, I would drop that dose down to 125 to 150 milligrams per week. You want to ideally inject this daily for stable serum concentrations and minimized side effects as well as minimized estrogen conversion. But don't get too neurotic about it. If you miss a few days, you're not gonna just die and fall over. Now the next step is ideally you're going to add a DHT compound on top of this. Personal favorite in this specific scenario would be Premobolin. I would actually vouch that you go out and buy Remobolin from Bayer, the actual pharmaceutical grade Remobolin, baby. One amp a week is about 20 bucks. We're going to add in one amp a week, which is 100 milligrams, and that dose should fit just perfectly for this case. But we do present ourselves with an issue. You see, Remobolin from Bayer is extremely thick, and it's near impossible possible to put into insulin syringes. What do I do? You put it in all in one whap. That simple. Doesn't require science or neuroticism. Just put it in all in one whap. You aren't going to die. You aren't going to experience unrealistically bad side effects. You're just going to feel pretty great. Growth hormone is pretty important too, not just for really anything beyond sleep. Also, I guess your skin, when you're using it at lower doses, really does improve. And I find that it does give you a little general feeling of euphoria. Euphoria uses about the sweet spot, especially with what we're trying to accomplish in this stack. 
you won't have too much cellular turnover to reach your Hayflix limit, which is when the cell can't turn over anymore, but you won't be getting null effects from really expensive ass growth hormone. You're gonna wanna inject this two doses per day. Or if you're like me, you're just gonna do it all at bed because you're a lazy motherfucker and business takes priority over virtually everything. But how I would structure it is two I use intramuscular within the morning before eating. Yes, you're gonna be fasting again, remember. Then two I use subcutaneously before bed. We don't need the fast onset of growth hormone here. We just need growth hormone in our blood serum to pump up those goodies that we can grow, collagen, synthesize, all that shit. I could explain the science, but I'm not trying to do oh, that no. to you. I'm just giving you the, the fucking protocol. These doses at four I use will ensure that you're staying lean, but also able to maintain a pretty sizable amount of muscle mass and get that unique growth hormone skin glow that you tend to get on relatively lower doses of growth hormone. Next compound, surprisingly, and you might have guessed it already, but maybe if you're new here, you didn't, is Cialis. Not just for the boners. Five milligrams a day of Cialis has actually been shown to improve cognitive function, depression, and anxiety anxiety better than SSRIs can even do. Secondly, it prevents atrophy of penile tissue and denervation of penile tissue. Super important for when you're aging. These two things, I assure you, will make you a happier man for the rest of your life. Of course, if you're the person with high blood pressure, it's going to help treat that as well, which is super fun. But if you're the person who is hypotensive, we run into an issue. Fixing that becomes the majority of what we need to focus on before adding in something like Cialis. And if you are slightly hypotensive, I would say try Cialis, but at five milligrams every other day as opposed to every day. And we're getting some motherfucking money down on this thing. The next product is Cerebralysis. This will turn your brain into a god peer processing machine. I love it personally for athletes who are strength based and need that CNS fatigue eliminated before big events. And for myself, I love it because I work insanely long hours. Like literally guys, I am in this room for probably 12 to 16 hours a day most days of the week outside of Friday. Something that many of you are likely very familiar with or can relate to. Doses can vary quite significantly here. I'm going to summarize the best I can. The protocol that I've found ultimately to work the best is doing an intramuscular injection once weekly at five milliliters. If you can get pharma amps of cerebral lysin, this is the way to go. Sadly, I don't have access to this in Canada or I would be using the living shit out of it like mad. The way that it inflates your business acumen is pretty nuts, but we progress regardless. Next is maybe an optional add-on, but I think it's quite good. Razadone for sleep architecture. I would use this intermittently at 50 milligrams per night that you do struggle to sleep quite a bit. It's non-addictive, so don't worry. The benefit here is that it's non-sedative. It's not going to make you just unconscious like most sleep medications. It's actually going to foundationally improve your sleep architecture, increasing the length of time that you're under slow wave sleep and REM sleep. Whereas some of the other options out there for sleep medications quite literally don't give you any slow wave sleep or REM sleep. They just put you into an unconscious state. You're not actually sleeping. Now, most people are missing out on this next compound, and it is an absolute game changer for libido and energy. Think of it as like the ultimate cheat code. And it's also going to make sure that you're able to do those long work days for 16, 18 hours. And it's human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. Big whap of that stuff a month at 5,000 I use is going to keep your balls working flawlessly and your neural steroids operating at a level that's going to give you cognitive enhancements like you've never seen before. Controversial, Yes. Going opposed to what many people have suggested before? Yes. But does it work? Very much so. Almost works too good, and it really doesn't need to be that complicated. And there's, again, many people who are going to tell me I'm wrong, and this won't work, and this is worthless to do, and it's a waste of money. To those people, I would say, have you tried it yourself? If the answer is no, then I say, please come back to me when you've tried it yourself. One last thing to kick in the balls before we wrap this with a bow. You likely want me to get out of your face as soon as humanly possible at this point. I just have to touch on this piece of the puzzle, and it's the last Last thing before we sadly depart and you head off into the eternal flames of the YouTube algorithm where the brain rot begins. Training is already a highly contentious topic and most bodybuilders, as we do, may hold an extremely rigid position on how to train effectively, even though you can do just about anything in the gym and be successful as long as you're doing it appropriately. Here's the thing, to sustain or even improve a physique that isn't massive in proportions, you don't need much training volume or intensity or frequency. Take it from retired bodybuilders who literally Really don't care to lift a finger if they don't have to, they're still jacked. So here's what I would do to max out my living potential and productivity, strictly while maintaining or improving a very solid physique. Three, 
gym sessions weekly. The gym addicts are crying just hearing this. In these sessions, you want to use things like myo reps to accumulate volume without accumulating time in the gym. And before I even get started into what all this means, I'm gonna have Mike Isertel define what a myo rep is so you can understand a bit better. How do you do myo reps? You choose, generally speaking, a weight you can do close to failure for between 10 and 20 reps in one set. And then you do your first working set, stopping at whatever rep shy failure you have for that week, three, four, two, one, whatever week it is. And then as soon as you stop, you rest just long enough to let the burn dissipate. So if you're doing curls, my reps, as long as the burn is out, as soon as the burn is out, go again. Do as many reps as you can until whatever shy of failure. Say it's, you know, a two RIR week, stop a two RIR, rest again, go again. You can stop doing these my rep sets either when you've had enough, you know, that volumize, it's enough of a stimulus, mega pump, you're super tired, stop. Or last case scenario, you stop when the reps drop below sets of five. For example, one day you could train upper body, do a straight set for the primary movements on chest and back, et cetera, and then do a myo rep set to follow that up. Now done two sets on all compound movements. And then with extremities, you're just gonna do a single myo rep set and call it good. And I know this is so high highly contentious and counter to likely what you have been doing most of your life. But I promise you it is worth saving your time and energy to capitalize on other things like monetary status and producing beautiful things that other people can enjoy. Not to mention even just saving your body. Now a couple more side points here because I know most people are, have already clicked off. Usually the retention isn't so great for videos like these. When you start increasing your testosterone, you're going to want to increase it slowly, starting at 100 milligrams, going up to 125 milligrams, and over the next four to eight weeks, getting up to your peak dose of 200 or 250 milligrams. This will lead to less side effects and better outcomes for you as you start increasing the dose. Now, if you need to use an AI to control estrogen, I recommend that you have some aromacin on hand, especially when you do your once monthly dose of HCG, it might be a really good idea to just suppress estrogen conversion if you know you convert quite highly already. Something like 6.25 milligrams of aromacin can keep you on the straight and narrow in terms of your estrogen. Make sure that you're not growing bitch titties. Something else you'll also want to do is likely add some supplementation with DHEA and pregnenolone. I would generally consume these orally in the evening because DHEA also suppresses the nervous system pretty potently. Lastly, if you're someone that suffers from DHT derived hair loss, you're in a bit of a pickle because I just recommended using a DHT as your primary method of hormone replacement therapy. If you are already eating a highly micronutrient saturated diet and you're hitting all of your 150 essential nutrients, then you would include something like a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Now my bias here is using dutasteride as that's orally the compound that we can dose with the least amount of frequency. For example, you can dose dutasteride every 10 days and still get a highly measurable effect and literally no side effects. The other thing I would do is look at topical dutasteride solutions. Now there is a company that I have no affiliation with called Strut Health and they do sell topical dutasteride solutions within the United States. If you're too afraid to take the oral tablet, which I have done myself and trust me, there's virtually no effects I've noticed even taking it on a daily basis, I think the topical solution might be just for you. But hopefully you found this video somewhat useful and if you did, I would recommend sending it to a friend who needs to get off cycle and on TRT and live a better life. Or if you enjoyed it, you could also just click subscribe down below and join our private Discord group, which is in the description of this video. We have tons of conversations there and you can ask me questions directly about literally anything related to pharmacology, nutrition, and training. There's tons of free resources and just an overall great community. Check it out. And otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for sticking around.